Hey guys, this week on the podcast, we're going to be talking about whitetail prep. It's getting to be that time of year. People are starting to think about fall, breaking their bows out, getting ready. That's exactly what we're doing. Jordan and I spent the prior week in Kansas scouting new ground, putting up deer stands, putting up trail cameras, and just trying to get an idea of what's going to happen when we go back up there in November. So if you're a deer hunter and you're thinking about deer season, which we all are, this is going to be a good episode for you. We're going to talk about some of the things we do that really help us get ready and get in the game. Enjoy. You good? Yep. Yep. I'm ready to talk about what we did been doing. About what we had done been doing. What we had done been doing doing. Been doing. Um. We've been doing. Well, we we always get ready for deer hunting, but in a different way this year. Yeah, not. We haven't done. I would, I've never done. Well, I have, but not since I've been at Primos. Yeah, I uh, haven't either since I've been at Primos. Let's uh. I guess we're kind of talking in vague terms. No one knows what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about what we've been doing. Yeah, but well, they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Jordan and I um, spent last week in Kansas. Um, Jordan and Brad both drew Kansas archery tags for November. <laughs> Jordan's not excited about it at all. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, but. Like we said, we always, especially, you know, this time of year, people are starting to think about the fall. You know, people are kind of getting tired of summer. I'm, well, I may be speaking for myself there. I know I'm kind of getting tired of the hot weather. And Any red-blooded American deer hunter is starting to think about deer hunting. Right. And uh, it's a little bit different uh, in Kansas. The I mean, there's, you know, different format, I guess. But um, the main gist of stand hanging and putting out trail cameras and kind of assessing a new property or not even a new property or a property maybe a property you have hunted before but there's still prep prep work yeah that goes into it especially in that part of the world where there's a lot of ag yeah it changes year to year based on what's planted where and, yeah and i think um this could be beneficial um to I guess not necessarily a wider audience, but an audience because um, a lot of times when we're talking about deer prep, uh, obviously a lot of the stuff trans- is translatable. But um, more specifically, in the past when we've talked about this, we're talking about cottonmouth. Yeah. And cottonmouth, although it be river land, a lot of the stuff does apply to the southeast as far as just big. Yeah, big timber tracks. Big, and- I mean, yeah, big, like big swaths of timber. Yeah. Hundreds, thousands of acres of unbroken timber, except for like food plots. Yeah. And in the Midwest, such as Kansas, you don't have that. You've got strips. Strip. You've got ditches. You've got creeks. you got little bitty areas they can't farm. That's the only place that's going to have places where deer stay. Yeah. The only spot they can't get a disc in the ground. Yeah. And so it's 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 definitely, it's, it's interesting. Um, I remember it's been like, golly, I'm getting old. Uh, it's been like seven years ago now the first time I experienced any of that. But yeah. from going to – because this is something, too. I just thought about this. If, um, you know, for folks all the time, if you're – I mean, if you're from the southeast or if you're from the northeast, anywhere, you know, everyone kind of hears about deer hunting in the Midwest. Cause it's, Especially Kansas now. Right. Kansas is growing like wildfire as far as people going to hunt the yeah. rut there. Mm-hmm. But my main reason in bringing that up is you have – there's always a good bit of guys that, you know, they finally either just take the time to do it or they save up the money to do it and they want to go – they want to go to the Midwest. And then they go from, say, hunting down here or somewhere where they're used to hunting just flat land or yeah. big pieces of timber and you go to the Midwest and it's completely different. And so well, – Yeah, and that's even – Kansas is even different than actually, you know, like Illinois, Iowa, that area. you mm-hmm. got a lot more timber in that part of the country than you do in Kansas. Yeah, very you true. Go, you go to some of these places in Kansas, and we're right on the edge of it where we're hunting at. The prairie, you know, meets all the ag dirt kind of right on the edge of the Midwest, I'd call it. You right, know? right. Which uh, still even like – um when I was talking about like in Iowa back in the, the yeah. internship days, we were hunting on public ground mostly. And on that public ground, they had big chunks of timber. Yeah. Not so much like at home, but a lot bigger than you see in Kansas. Yeah, because it's been protected for so right. many years and they hadn't turned it into farm dirt. Correct. Correct. And so um, I think it'd be beneficial for everybody, you know, hearing about kind of not saying what we do is the only way to do it. There's no, no by, yeah. by no means. Yeah, there's no set way, which, and I would say anything that I do right, um, 
I did not invent. I'm just taking what I've learned from people that know better than I do mm-hmm. and and uh, applying those things to the woods, and it, it, it tends to work out for me when I take what I've learned because there's a lot of people that know more than I do that I've been able to learn from. Yeah. Um, so as far as – so let's just let's just talk about first off like what what we did. So we drove up there, met with the farmer, friend of yours. Yep, Mr. Jerry, he's been so good to me over the years. Mm-hmm. I met him when I was working at Mossy Oak. We actually me and Jimmy Riley went up there and filmed a TV show at his place and you know, he's one of those guys that's lived in the area forever and just he loves everybody. Yeah. He helps anybody he can, just whatever and by doing that he's got access to a whole bunch of dirt yeah which is uh a pro tip number one you could take away um and which some people aren't into i, I know there's i know some guys they want to go out there they don't want to they don't want it's they don't want any help from anybody they want to figure it out by themselves yeah. which if you want to do that that's your thing knock it out but if you're not against getting help if you can find a local, you know, when you're going to a new spot, mm-hmm. if you can find, like, which in our our spot, it was uh, Jerry, which, disclaimer, if you've, if you've watched the show at all, then you've seen us hunt at, uh, we've, we've turkey hunted there. We've, Twice. We've done two turkey shows there yep. with Mr. Jerry. Um, but, yeah, if you can find, you know, if you're going to a new place, if you can find a farmer or somebody who's willing to give you some local knowledge, that is priceless information. <laughs> yeah. It can, it can yeah. set you, it can put you leaps and bounds ahead and cut your time in half and, and and what you're trying to do and go ahead and get you in the game and like mr jerry you know he he deer hunts but he's doesn't have a whole lot of time to do it a lot right but he knows where they're at oh yeah 100 percent. i learned that this past week and even farmers that don't hunt can tell you where they see all the deer at mm-hmm. they're sitting there looking at them they can tell from their crop too their crop yield yeah <laughs> where, the, where a lot of deer yeah, are at. they're over there they're eating my beans like, yeah, okay. get rid of them <laughs> <laughs> that's usually the attitude you know because yeah. they i mean they can do some i mean goodness that one spot we hung a stand that, that corner of that soybean field yeah the beans were like the rest of the bean field was like i don't know like knee high yeah three four foot tall three and a half feet tall and then that one little corner, they was mowed down. Let's let's talk about that farm. You know, that's a place I've hunted a couple of those places. We've quail yep. hunted, we've turkey hunted a couple of these places. We got stands on, but this track, nobody, Mr. Jerry's never hunted it. We've never hunted it, yep. and we kind of just went in there blind trying to figure out where a good spot yep. was. Which Midwest, these creek draws and stuff, it's not hard to figure out where the deer yeah. will be going. Just hard to figure out the x you got to be in a stand to get a 30 yard shot but yeah. as far as where you can look at a map and tell where the deer are going to travel is pretty daggum easy yeah because i remember um before we went up there you had uh you had that that form that we're talking about pulled up on your own x yeah and immediately we didn't we didn't put stands right where me and you kind of looked at but it was yeah. pretty dang close it was to within some of, sight yeah because you could like i said you can look on those places where where they have just these narrow strips of timber and you can kind of go all right well there's a pinch right there Mm -hmm. and it you know funnels down really good right here and it's it's a um like you're talking about it's it's a it's so different than here yeah whereas you're just looking at a huge piece of timber and you can't you you got to have some boots on the ground Mm -hmm. for a time to start putting it together but yeah let's talk about that property so that one particular property is what 600 a section the guys letting us hunt Uh and uh it's so cool an area because it meets the Flint Hills. Mm-hmm. It's where the Flint Hills start on the north region. And, uh, I mean, you're going from ag dirt in the bottoms to big prairie. I mean, mm-hmm. thousands and thousands of acres of prairie that goes for miles. And you look at that, you're like, where are the where do the deer stay out here? It can't be even more two or three deer here, but yeah. they stay in these ditches and creek runs and wherever they can find a little bit of cover, the deer yeah. stay at. Grow so, up CRP. Yeah, and that's one good thing about this property. It's got a 40-acre block on the north end of it that nobody goes in. Mm-hmm. It's landlocked. We can't hunt it. Nobody mm-hmm. can hunt it unless they get an easement through the landowner. Yeah. But it's so cool. This particular spot is that that's going to be your wheel wheelhouse you For know sure. where the deer are staying at so you can tell that on the map and what we did our lands on the south end of it we pulled off those creeks those little draws that's running off at 40 acres and mm-hmm. found good trees to film out of right because if that's always a good rule of thumb too i'm not trying to get overly basic but um even if 
even if you, it's a place like this we're talking about that really does not get hunted yeah. virtually, you know, um, still the deer are naturally going to go to the place where is the most undisturbed yeah and has the best cover Mm -hmm. and so that particular spot where you're talking to that that 40 acres it's grown up nasty thick i mean just picture perfect bedding yeah and then just top it off with the fact that it's landlocked and nobody goes in there yeah it's just i mean there's no telling what's gonna come out of there yeah you know we our whole goal here is you know primos hadn't been out of the out of the south deer hunting in years Mm-hmm. we've been doing everything cotton mouth and we've all got the itch here recently let's go to the midwest during a run during a rut hunt rut hunt there, there it, it is goes. there i it got is. it together yeah you got hung up a little bit there but you know calling deer and all that i mean that's really our that's our wheelhouse that's and our bread and butter that's our primos that's what we do we sell calls we do all, we sell everything for our food plot seed blinds and all that but it was started on yeah. turkey calling deer calling yeah it was, a, it was a call company and that's still what we primarily are and obviously we can call deer at cottonmouth yeah but just like we said just like we said it's different hunting there calling deer in the midwest is different yeah they're much more visible yeah. you got a lot more open dirt and those bucks are running those creek draws that time of year and the rut's way more intense because there's not as many does right right I mean, the deer numbers in the south are just crazy how right. many deer we have and it's very easy to get off whack as far yeah. as your numbers well you know when you have just personal opinion i think you know this big block those huge you know monotonous blocks of timbers that we have yeah makes a higher carrying capacity yeah so you just don't have as many and i think you just have a naturally tighter buck to doe ratio in those areas well and like i just said they're much more visible running those creek draws and stuff if you're hunting a 200 acre block of timber that buck could be 100 acres over, and you'll never see him cruising. But right. in Kansas, where these spots we're hunting at, we're going to be able to see them for five, 600 yards yeah. and be able to call to them. Changes the game. Yeah. And the spots we set up are just far calling. I mean, that's why we picked them out. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. talk about Chuck E. Cheese stand. Yeah, that's how <laughs> I wanted to talk to. I wanted to take each stand individually and break down what got us there and why we ended up putting them in that tree. And they may not be successful, but we feel like they will be. Yeah, I think, uh, like you said, it, there's always a chance you'll have to, you know, maybe modify the stand a little bit or maybe move. But I think we're, I, I think we're pretty close. Yeah, just off of what we're seeing. So. Um, we're just going to break it down from, from the first one. So we hop in the Ranger, yeah. and we drive down, and um, we get to the first spot. And you just kind of break down what we saw. Yeah, I mean, we got out of the Ranger, like Lake said, and we started looking around, trying to figure out, looking for trails coming to this bean field, what we first started mm-hmm. doing first. And we looked off in this creek bottom, and it's, what, 100 yards wide and big open creek bottom. It's beautiful. There's been cows in there grazing, so it's open timber. You know the deer aren't going to be staying there. They're not going to be right. living right there. Right. And then we walked north to that fence line of the 40 acres and looked off in there and jumped three bucks up. Mm-hmm. One of them's dang good one. Well, <laughs> they're living right here. Mm-hmm. That's why we decided to go in August, so we're not putting a lot of pressure right before we hunt. Mm-hmm. So... We saw those bucks, and then we came down the fence, found a good trail, and they're following this fence north and south. They're coming yeah. out of that 40, right? going straight to that bean field. It wasn't hard to figure out. <laughs> no. it's it, it, it When you have that it's that condensed area like that, and not only that, it really, in that, that draw, that creek bottom, it necks down really hard yep. right there. And you got another draw coming in from the east. Mm-hmm. So you got two main travel corridors for deer connecting at one mm-hmm. and that's where the x is we thought for put the stand yeah the, which and, and the other thing too with that bean field um those bucks are going to be cruising that yeah no doubt no yeah. that's where they're yeah. scraping at because that's the most you know those are going to be coming out there looking for food mm-hmm. and those bucks are going to be sent checking those fields for sure and that was like i said there, there was a lot of different factors that went into that specific spot but we're just trying to name all of them off. I'm trying, yeah. to, I'm trying not to leave anything out. The main thing, a lot of things I've learned about hunting Midwest, especially cow country like that, mm-hmm. is fences. A lot of these new fences are tight, and they're five and a half, six foot tall. And those deer are going to travel. I mean, they jump them very easy, but they're going to cross where it's the easiest yeah. at. Yeah. And right at the corner of this bean field where this fence runs north and south, there's an old fence that runs east and west. And there is a gap right there that has this... And you can tell it's been traveled 
for years because it is a swag in that fence where they pushed a wire, stretched a mm-hmm. wire out. Yeah. And we found a tree 20 yards from it. Yeah. And I mean, it looks like it's going to be money. Yeah. And another, us calling these deer or trying, going to try to call deer up, if a buck's cruising that creek down through there or coming from the north and you're calling to him, he has got to come up to that gap and look to be mm-hmm. able to figure out where that sound's coming from. Because mm-hmm. it's a little rise, a little ridge. And if a deer's 10 yards on the other side of us where we're trying to mimic that noise, they're going to have to come up there and look and see where it is. Right. So that's yeah. that's what's good about that spot. That's that's another thing, too, to talk about. Um, not only just calling, but a lot of times I, I caught myself thinking about, especially because we were out there so early and what I'm used to doing at Cottonmouth, when we're getting stuff ready, we're thinking about food sources. Yeah. Which food sources play a role. Yeah, because you know you, that's where your does are going to be going. Yep. But like we're we're hanging these stands with the mindset of going after bucks that are up on their feet cruising looking for does. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, like I said, food sources play a role in that, but not as big. It's not like we're hunting early season. You yeah, know? you're not hunting just afternoon traffic coming to that bean field. Correct, correct. We're looking for travel routes, and like I said, we're we're close to that uh, that forty acres. It's real thick because we know. Uh, there'll be does hemmed up in there. They're going to be bucks wanting to go in there yeah. and check that to find them a doe. But, I mean, you, person, anybody else be like, why don't y'all just get right on the on the edge of that 40 acres? Well, if you do that, you're, I mean, we're 200 yards from it. If In my mind, if we get right on the edge of that 40-acre field or CRP, you got to walk through possibly two or three deer, and if you bump them, they're going in there, and going everything's going to be alerted. Mm-hmm. So we tried to... I mean, it's a lot of different things that go into picking out these spots, and that's another one not bumping anything going in. Yeah, the the the, the where that stand is, where both of them are actually, you we you're able to get to them. The access is pretty good. Yeah, which I will say, I know some guys that hunt in the Midwest. That's where they live. It's where they hunt the whole season, mm-hmm. and sometimes they will get aggressive like that. If yeah. you if you're hunting there for like we're there for what like six days. Yeah. If you're going to be there for the whole season, then you can possibly afford to get that aggressive. Yeah, a lot get. of people will sit on the outskirts until it's time to move in there. Yeah. You know, you got a two or three day period where it's time to do something yeah. during the rut. I remember a guy, um, I mean, like he was, right, I'm talking, it, it would be the equivalent of doing what you're talking about, mm-hmm. which this was, it was kind of, um, I can't remember what stage it was in. It was years ago, but I remember watching the video. He was uh, worked with us up there, but I'm talking like right, you, you could, you could, dang near lean over and spit into the bedding area yeah. you know you could see where it started and he got up in there and it worked out well, at least we, it, we might end up doing yeah, that like I said, you you can do that uh for sure especially like i said if you've got all season to do it but our approach typically is to start out on the fringes and if we have to then mm-hmm. push in i think you're i think you're better off that way plus i think I, especially we, we called that stand the chuck e cheese stand can't yeah. really even remember why we called it that <laughs> One of us might have been thinking about pizza, but <laughs> oh, no. but uh, the Chuck E. Cheese stand, I think, is in a fantastic spot. And I, I like I said, at this point, unless we go in there and see something we have to move, we can get there with relatively not disturbing anything. Yeah, and it's a very good watching spot, too. You can see a long ways. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, and where was my thought there? I had a thought and I lost it. I'll get it back. Um, but... Yeah, the, these stands, you know, uh, that's a that's a huge part of it as well is not getting in there and just busting the whole woods up. Yeah. Getting in there and not bumping anything. I mean, hopefully nobody else will step foot in that draw until we're there to hunt. Mm-hmm. That's their plan anyway. You mm-hmm. don't ever know because we don't own the land or it's not an outfitter. It's got control on it all the time. I mean, we don't live there, but, yeah. you know, hopefully – Nobody yeah. will be in there. Kudro and his buddies maybe down in there mud riding. I yeah. hope not. They're riding their four wheelers <laughs> through that bottom. I hope not, but that, you don't know. Yeah, that happened to me one time in Illinois. <laughs> but uh, found this spot. It was on the CRP field yeah. around the edge, and which and also Kudro is not an actual person. It's a name I made up at the top <laughs> of my head. I feel like that would be obvious, but this day and age, you got to clarify everything. Yeah. Uh, so that, before we move to the next one, then um, a lot of times especially this time of year you're wanting to get an inventory or an idea of what you got Mm -hmm. so we use trail cameras yeah that's what i say we use a lot of people use trail cameras this day and age and the thing about us not living there not probably not going back to the time to hunt we put out cell cams Mm -hmm. and 
I hate it, but that one particular spot, we didn't have any cell service, mm-hmm. so we won't know what's there till Mr. Jerry hopefully goes in there and swaps cards for us here mm-hmm. in a few months. Mm-hmm. Then we'll know, but that's the one spot that I was like, man, yeah. I wish we had cell service, but yeah, it but happens I mean, like that. When you're down in the middle, of, like I said, when you're in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, in the Flint Hill somewhere, and in, yeah. a, in a bottom... There's like a big draw, you know. <laughs> There's about 100 people within 100 square miles yeah. to supply cell service. <laughs> cell service is not the best. Yeah. So, you know, you do what you can. But, like, it, you can you can look at that place and, and see. I mean, it, and see that there's deer there. You oh, know, yeah. just the habitat's too great. You got all your food. You got your cover. You got you got everything. Yeah. It's, I mean, that is, I'm by far the most excited about this particular property. Yeah. It looks pretty great. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, that's the that's the Chuck E. Cheese stand, right there on the, uh, right there on that creek bottom. Yep. On the edge of those beans. I, like I said, we'll uh, Lord willing, when we do a follow up podcast sometime in November after this hunt, we'll be talking about the Chuck E. Cheese stand again. Yeah. <laughs> or I won't be able to talk because I'm still so happy. <laughs> <laughs> September is almost here. That means it's almost time to be chasing big bugling elk. Head on over to primos.com and check out the Ultimate Elk Checklist, your personal guide to everything you need to be successful in the elk woods. There's even some videos with Will and Jimmy explaining what they put in their bow and gun vest and why. And also, we're doing a loaded bow hunter vest giveaway. You can sign up to win a Primos bow hunter vest loaded out with some of your favorite elk calls. Head on over to primos.com or click the link in our Facebook post to fill out the form. No purchase necessary. Or we could be talking about the hickory stand Ooh, which nice. which is uh if you follow us on um if you follow primo's hunting store if you follow primo's on instagram you saw us put up some stories about that spot yeah um that's uh that's a bona fide calling spot mm-hmm. i mean it's it's some trails coming out of that 40 acres again we're farther to the west mm-hmm. probably 300 yards yeah pretty much directly west yeah and uh i mean it's a spot we're going to be able to see them a long way and try to figure out how to move in mm. if we need to. It may kill one out of that tree. It's very possible. Mm-hmm. But our thinking on that was, you know, we could move to the north and be right on the property line. But then again, you're right on the property line. When I just don't feel comfortable doing right, that. Right, right, yeah. But there's five or six this mega trails coming in the corner of this bean field. Big trails. But, and that, that's what we were talking about earlier when you said, I mean, it's a, it's a big bean field. And then it kind of curves in makes a little cove yeah, it's uh, kind of shaped like an upside down l yeah or yeah. if you're looking at it from the north it is an l it's an yeah yeah it's real it's probably a quarter mile long half mile long by 300 yards wide then it got yeah. a little cove in the back of it yeah and that little cove in the back has been pulverized yeah the by be- the deer the beans on it every little snip is i mean every bean's been snipped off at the top yeah which again i mean it just makes good deer sense it's right there by that bedding area yeah. and that's the most secluded secure feeling spot where they can go out and get them some beans yeah so our thinking on that was we backed we had a tree picked out right on the corner where if the deer crossed the fence came out the bean field it'd be a 30 yard shot and mm-hmm. got to thinking about it more you know it's very possible deer could get down window it's right there mm-hmm. let's put it on the corner up here it's going to be 150 yards from where the deer are coming out right now who knows where they'll be coming out in November, but they should be coming out at the same spot. Yeah, which, you know, a lot of times, like, I was all gung-ho about that first spot. It looked, I just yeah. thought it looked awesome. You know, that there, there was, a like, a deep, that creek falls off, like, right behind that tree. So, mm-hmm. again, great for calling, and it just, with it coming, it just, it just pinched down so good right there. But then, you know, me, I'm very prone to getting excited and not fully thinking through a situation. And so doing what we said that you know we did the first time we're like hey let's back up a little bit yeah and if we need to press in more we can but well the tree we found and finally hung the stand in is right on the corner where that l starts Mm -hmm. where it got dives back in a little cove but where you're at in that tree you can see to the south of you 600 yards Mm -hmm. you can see to the west of you 600 yards i mean you can see north of you a long ways and by doing that, you know, we sit there that first afternoon and see those deer crossing, you know, 200 yards from us. We can move in. Right. If we had to put it in the stand right there on the edge of the woods, we'd been able to see 100 yards and that'd been it. Right. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, we sit here one afternoon, figure out where the deer are coming, 
might even kill one out of the tree. It's very yeah. possible. Yeah. But you'll be able to. It's just like watching ducks. You know, you mm-hmm. sit one afternoon, watch where the ducks are fine, and you go back in the next morning and kill them. Mm-hmm. That's what my plan is on that tree. Yeah, which is always um, you, a lot of some people call them like an observation stand. Yeah. Which we is, do it at Cotton Mile. Yeah, yeah, we we for sure do. And I, it's a uh, it's a lot of people. Um, I don't know if a lot of people's the right terminology. Uh, I, I've known of it's it's a common thing that you see especially like when we're talking about the guy that's traveling to hunt that's never done it before yeah they don't really want to waste time on an observation stand it's worth it they want to get get in there and and which i get that i you know i I Mm -hmm. get that it's the same kind of mindset as when you know people go elk hunting for the first time they don't want to take them a couple few days glass and figure it out they want to get in there and get after Mm -hmm. it which again i understand but i think you season's open you're supposed to be hunting yeah but i think you know like in this current situation we're not taking ourselves out of the game. Like, I think we very much could kill a deer out of that tree. Yeah, and that same creek we've been talking about makes a curve right behind it. Mm-hmm. It's very thick in there where a bunch of blowdowns and stuff are. Out. So it's very possible you start hitting horns together or whatever, and that buck comes peeking up there at 300 yards, he's going to come over and look. Right. So you're still in the game, but at the same point, you're able to see a lot to where you can call the audible if you need to. Yeah. And move. That was my, that's why I'm so fired up about that because we're going, I mean, it shouldn't take long if the deer are moving to figure out where they're at, you know, where right. the X is to be at. Right. Because you can see them. Yeah. Um, and then, like, if, if you're not, um, we, we've touched on it some, but a lot of times when we say this calling spot is great, it's a great calling spot. Some of the reasons that we're saying that, especially like one factor that involves in is we're we're bow hunting. Yeah. So obviously, if we're calling deer up, we need to call them into bow range. Yeah. You know? For me, uh, twenty yards. Right. <laughs> For me, fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's break. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. Let's break that down because a lot of people don't know what you're talking about when you say a calling spot. Mm, man, I didn't. It's it, it. You learn every time you go out there, yeah. and there's been several times I think about my you know younger days or even the first time i hunted iowa i'd be in a spot just wide open and i'd be calling that deer i was looking at and wondering why it wasn't coming wide open meaning that deer can see everything around you exactly exactly same same as calling turkeys exactly if you're in wide open hardwood bottom you up and at a turkey 200 yards and he can see 100 yards behind you and you don't have a decoy out very possible he's not gonna come yeah he's going there's no turkey there and a deer does the same thing yep so like the well, except they circle downwind except too. they circle downwind <laughs> so this hickory stand in particular like i said the tree backs up right up to that creek yeah thick bunch of blow downs falling over stuff so if you're calling to a deer one he can't circle downwind of you if the you know because that creek's right there yeah and unless he wants to jump down a 20 foot bluff to get around the back of you the only way he's going to be able to get downwind right and also with all that thick stuff right behind the tree he can't just look there and go, there's no deer there. Yep. So he's got to come investigate. Yep. That's the whole thought process behind it. Because if you think about it, like when I finally thought about it, I was like, well, duh, no wonder they're not coming to me. Yeah. They're, they're not stupid, you know. They're like, I hear a deer, but I don't see one. And they're, deer and turkeys share the same, you know, uh, mentality. They're always on alert yeah they're they're like uh i like the the um derek who i was talking about talking to about coyotes he said i like the term he used he said they're phobic about everything Mm -hmm. and it applies you know deer always i mean there's a lot of things out there like to eat a deer yeah you know and so they they ain't just gonna come walking stupid into a wide open spot because they heard a deer you know yeah but during that time of year in november if you got all the stuff in place right wind spot where they can't circle down wind of you very easily and then spot where they can't see if they're curious enough or they have to come investigate yeah. same way with you know hunting in the south or not just the south but big timber lots mm-hmm. if you find a spot that's got a couple of blow down trees or some kind of thicket in the middle of a wide open wood lot that's where you need to call from mm-hmm. no doubt i mean it's worked for us at cottonmouth you know we'll hunt these little ditches and ridges and stuff that only a two or three foot elevation change but that deer can't see in there from the ground right works the same way it's just a matter about making that deer believe there's a deer over there without it being a deer there yeah you gotta you gotta be able to trick them to a degree Mm -hmm. to make them to make them come in like that 
But I think we are going to take our old decoy out there, too, and try it. It's a good point. That's another thing that can help you. Th- those big Midwest aggressive bucks, I mean, mm-hmm. they get a whole lot madder than our deer, deer, deer seem like they do. Yeah, mo- on a very, on average, for sure. Yeah. For sure. I, I mean, there, there's some outliers there, obviously. There's some properties that down here that do it. Because I know that because last time, I can't remember if it was on a show or on this, we said something according to that, and we got some not mad but like hey I, we had somebody like hey i hunt somewhere somewhere in the southeast he was like i had deer smash the decoy i'm like man great for you yeah I mean, like, honestly i'm not i'm like awesome that that happens for you on a consistent basis but I, it's not a it's not a uh it's not a i'm not overstepping my my bounds by saying down here it doesn't typically work as well yeah it works but just not as much yeah down there in the midwest it just seems to work more consistently mm-hmm. so and that's another spot this this set up the old hickory stand it's in a hickory tree is why we call it that yeah that one makes more sense than chucky e. cheese <laughs> <laughs> but anyway the, if uh, you put a decoy 20 yards out in front of you facing back towards the stand that buck's gonna want to come down wind of you and he can't unless he was in bow range mm-hmm. so that's another good thing about that yeah talk, talk about like like kind of just go into that detail a little bit more why are you facing that decoy the way you, way you are well, I mean, I'm going to face it. I'm going to face it quartering away from me, probably, or quartering, you know, to the, my side. Right. Because that buck's going to come up behind that decoy from the back. Exactly. He Same way a turkey does. Or yep. Usually. And if you, I mean, a lot, if you face it dead to you, that buck's going to come up straight behind that decoy and you ain't never going to get a broadside shot. Right. By the time he hits it and runs off, mm-hmm. you know. So if you set it quartering away or quartering side to side, you very could get a broadside shot yeah. when he comes circle up behind it yeah which that's pretty crazy to see if you've never seen that happen before yeah i've, <laughs> I've seen it once yeah you know? the last time i saw it i was in the midwest mm-hmm. and watch him walk up that thing all bristled up i was like whoa <laughs> yeah it's crazy <laughs> yeah i actually used i've been hunting in illinois since i was like 15 i had in the last couple of years but i did up until then and Used to take a dang on Glendale Buck up there. I didn't know any better. And they'd come to it. Your dad still does. Yeah, my dad still does. He's a Glendale doe <laughs> without any legs. <laughs> yeah. We but, should get Bo on here one week and tell him, talk about the expertise of. Talk, middle, talk about some deer tips. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> like hunting with TK and Mike. <laughs> I remember the uh, the first time that I went hunting with jordan and his dad in illinois it's been like three years ago now Mm -hmm. but like it's in november i can't remember what day but i mean it's november you know it's like the time first week yeah it's the time in the midwest everyone knows unless you you don't leave the stand unless you have to yeah it's that time of year and it's like 8 30 in the morning (laughs) and i i'm sitting there and i'm uh over this cut cornfield i'm kind of at a part where it necks down really good i mean if a, if the deer walked the i mean it necks down hard like if the deer could be walking the other side of this little part and it'd be like a 40 yard shot it's like an hourglass yeah and i'm sitting there and all of a sudden like probably 150 175 yards away i see this huge buck come busting out of the woods and come stand there and i'm like first thing i'm like oh my gosh i mean it's like a 160 inch deer yeah and I'm thinking, is he chasing a doe that I didn't see come through there first? But then I see him whip his head back and look, so, you know, back behind him. And I see him take off again. I'm like, that deer was bumped. <laughs> like 15 seconds later, here comes here comes Bo <laughs> walking across the cornfield. I'm like, yep. what's happening here? <laughs> that is hunting with Bo Blissett. Does Bo listen to this podcast? I don't know. I'm probably going to send this one to him. Though. If he does, he'd probably be upset at me. <laughs> but that. <laughs> I got to call a deer up that week. Yeah. It was fun. Same kind of situation. Yeah. Just I found a thicket and side of CRP field and right at dark started doing blind calling and looked over the way there and there come this buck walking up through there and he was actually going towards you. Yeah. And I started grunting at him and turned him. Because I just rattled. Yeah. He was coming to your call and I cut him off. He got cut off. <laughs> <laughs> it happens mostly to me. And I grunted and snort wheezed <laughs> at him and he turned around and walked 15 yards from me but he couldn't see he had to come up here and look yeah that that's always the that's all i mean you'll have your outliers but that's always the typical case if you're in a spot and that you catch them in the right mood if you're in a spot like that where they can't look and investigate without coming close mm-hmm. you put yourself very much in the ball game i wasn't eight feet off the ground yeah that's another thing man you can you say and look i'm not trying to say 
something's easier, harder, that everything's got their different challenges and ups and downs, but there are certain things that are just different. Yeah. You know, like uh, 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 in that area, you can get away. Like if you had your climber stand that high off the ground at Cottonmouth, forget about it. Oh, no, they'd see you. Absolutely forget about it. But for some reason there, they just don't Hicks, tend to. They see us 30 feet up in a tree. Yeah, yeah, they do. And one time I've had my pull-up rope maxed out before and i you know that's just they're different but there you can you can get away with a lot more stuff i think it's from all the wild cats jumping out of the trees on them <laughs> they have to look up those wild cougars <laughs> panthers yeah. panthers are getting them rabbit armadillos out of the tree <laughs> chupacabra primo's takeout has changed the way that we hunt from minerals to feed to the seed that we plant our food plots with it has been incredible Head on over to primos.com now to check it out and receive free shipping on orders at $75 and more. But, yeah, that's uh, – it's it's interesting. It's always fun, too, because, I mean, it, it got me all fired up. I'm not even – I don't even have a tag. I'm just filming. Yeah. But it doesn't matter if you're in the woods in the Midwest getting to see that and you're a deer hunter. It's a change of pace for sure yeah. for us. It's 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 great. And, I, I honestly, I can't wait. I can't, I can't wait to see what those stands – produce what yeah. we get to see out of them no doubt we got no cameras up we do have one working that sent us a buck picture yeah so yeah same kind of situation there um kind of a, it's a strip of timber it's more of a travel yeah. you know it's not so much calling spot but it's more mm -hmm. of catching deer going for food yeah because you're in between two ag fields yeah and uh and it's in, I mean, you could, I mean, right now you could see the trails just pouring through oh, there yeah. where they cross constantly. You could kill a deer out of that stand the first week it opens up. Probably so. Yeah. Probably so. Which the, the only negative of that trip was that we didn't, we, we really wanted to have some time to take the evenings and watch some of those bean fields and see if we could catch some of those deer yeah. coming out. But we just never, just well, didn't have the time. We had rain on us every morning, so we had to wait till 11 o'clock mm -hmm. to get in the woods, and we didn't quit till dark. So mm -hmm. it's one of them deals I'd rather get the stands ready more than look at them in the afternoon. It's just kind of, you got to use the time you have to yep. do the most productive thing. Yeah. Because uh -huh. if you're looking at bucks in a bean field right now, who knows where they'll be first week of November. Yeah, you don't know. You got your, I'm sure there'll be some, they're still hanging around, but then there'll be some, you know, it worked. Now this does apply to, to everywhere during the rut. You'll have you, that time of year, uh, whenever your rut is like at Cottonmouth, it's December there, it's November. You'll have some, if you, you know, been running cameras constantly, you'll always have some bucks show up. Seems like you're like, where in the world did he come from? Yeah, especially the farm we've been talking about. It's a creek draw that runs for five miles north mm -hmm. without a county road cut through it. Which is very uncommon everything in the midwest kansas pretty, pretty much you know the central kansas east to who knows illinois iowa illinois, indiana everything sectioned pretty mm -hmm. much you got section roads that run through just about everything so you don't have a lot of big tracts of land that go undisturbed with a county road right and this place does yeah and when you have those main travel corridors like we're talking about and you happen to be in one of them yeah, you're who in, knows what you're going to see. You're in a good spot. You know, you're in and a good area. Touching on that farm again, the Chucky Farm, it is the only ag to the south for five miles. All the rest of it is cow country. Right. Who knows? I mean, you no don't know what telling. you're going to see. Ain't no telling. <laughs> no telling. And, and that country, a 200-inch deer is not her, unheard of. No, it's not. It sounds foreign to me, but it's not foreign there. Yeah, you talk, if you told us we were going to see a I had a possibility of seeing 200 inch deer on cottonmouth i'd be like whatever yeah i mean yeah we got some big, nice deer over there some big deer but, but 200 inch deer that's, that's a whole different yeah ball game plus those deer over there in canada are so big i mean 300 pound deer yeah, yeah. which i mean where we're hunting in the delta that's to you know central mississippi where i grew up hunting you know a mature buck's gonna be like 180 dude i killed a deer when i was in high school that hit 100 he was right at 200 pounds and you just thought i'd killed a 200 inch deer because he was 200 pounds that's huge yeah yeah it's huge for there which at cottonmouth it usually averaged like 220 230 yeah like the, the two big deer rocker last year he was like 240 pounds and mm -hmm. the deer i killed 250 pounds that's the yeah. biggest deer we've killed in several years yeah for his body. I, th I think the biggest one that ever come off cottonmouth since i've been there was like 286 yeah which again we were like holy smokes which yeah. if, if you kill a 286 in the midwest yeah you're talking about average 250 pound deer yeah our average is 190 yeah. 200 pounds yeah 
That one that you killed that year that we were talking about earlier with when we were up there with your dad, he was like 300. Yeah, he was huge. Sucker was huge. Yeah. It took all of us, every bit of us, to get him up in the in the back of a buggy. And we were struggling. You remember having to get him across that fence? Yeah, a fence in a little ditch. We had to, luckily, like the easiest, uh, the easiest path to get there was to cross a fence that was not on the property that we were hunting, but luckily Bo's... Uh, friend who we were hunting with knew i called the guy said yeah y'all go in there and get him no problem thank god yeah literally think because if we had to if we couldn't have crossed that fence right there holy smokes we were gonna be quartering and packing like a elk you'd have to <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't get out to the next morning yeah because it whoo, whoo. those deer are special to me yeah and they're, they're so much fun to hunt and it's it's a because that's that's i'll throw this in there too if you if you're a whitetail hunter if you're a bow hunter especially I think you you owe it to yourself to go see the rut in the Midwest at least once. Yeah, I mean it's been when would we go to Illinois? Like three falls ago. I think it was three years ago. That's the last time I've been. Same. I mean, and every year we're sitting in Cottonmouth the first week of November, struggling because yeah. that's our lull big yeah. time. Yeah, the October lull in the Midwest is we, it's just a real thing for us. It's the November lull. Yeah, the first two weeks of November. I mean, last year wasn't so bad because we had cold weather, but years prior tough mm -hmm. and we're sitting there at camp cottonmouth just looking at our instagram and whatnot oh gosh they're killing them left and right in the middle usually talking to our buddy tommy nails at whiskey ridge yeah. he's sending us trail cam pics and videos from the stand these bucks running does we're like oh, oh, oh. don't talk to me anymore <laughs> <laughs> keep it to yourself tommy yeah <laughs> no one cares actually i care a lot i'm just jealous yeah <laughs> well we're getting we're gonna get the experiences this year hopefully yeah. Pray, pray for good weather and cold weather. Yeah. It'd be yeah. this time for them all day sits and just consistent winds from the north. Cuz that's the, that's the yeah, consistent winds from the north and that's it's just that when you're in that area just not, and look again, I if you've I've said it before and Jordan's the same way like I come from hunting pine row deer. Like the deer a yeah. uh, hundred that's still like it, unless I'm like told not to or can't do it, I'll shoot the first mature buck I see every time. But still when you're in that area, like the Midwest, and you know that there is a not a small chance, a good chance of seeing a true giant come walking through there, it's, whoa. Yeah. Just leave, you know, the whole time you're on the stand, you just feel like you're just sitting on the edge of your seat, just anticipating. Just I'm, where I'm, you, I'm still going to shoot the first one that gets my heart pumping come back. <laughs> no, 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 I can't see him. can't see him. Let him go. Let yeah. him go. Hmm. If he makes me get the shakes, I'm going to shoot him. Yeah, which is, you know. To yeah. each their own, man. You know, deer hunting's about having fun. Mm -hmm. Big part of it. Um, but yeah, that was our week. I feel like it was very productive. Um, we got, like I said, we didn't. We honestly didn't get all the spots hung that we wanted to hang. You know, we probably could have hung more, but we just yeah. didn't have the time. But the the most, the, like the other spots that we have, we'd either Jordan had either seen at least once or had some experience mm -hmm. on. We wanted to make sure that we tackled the Chuck E. Cheese farm because no one had ever seen it. Yeah. So we're like, that'd be the one that would take the most time. And so yep. we we spent two days there, you know. Yeah, I mean. Or a whole day. A lot of our time, this is something people need to know, too. You know, we talked to the farmers and people that own this land for hours while we were up there, just mm -hmm. getting to know them and, you know, just – better lack of words just pr and you know mm -hmm. that's one thing that really helps is just spending time with those guys and just Look, getting to know them better yeah, and they know who's hunting their property letting us know we appreciate them and i honestly it's not a not a thing they appreciate us because they just deer eat a lot of their crops yeah <laughs> but you know i think it was a productive week and um hopefully you know who the listeners will get some good ideas of, of things to do when they tackle you know whitetail prep and everything that goes into it there's a lot of different facets but yeah i'm still learning too but i think we're in a we're in an okay spot to be able to figure it out for sure yeah for sure good. all right i think we're in a good enough spot to wrap this up um guys if you're listening hope you enjoyed this conversation uh me and jordan like i said we learn every time we go out there and hopefully y'all can learn learn a thing or two as well but uh if you have any questions don't hesitate to send them in and uh yeah we're done thank you for listening to the podcast